God's word. All right, let's start. So I'm a little sick, so if I stop, start coughing or something, please excuse me. Um, today we're doing, first of all, any questions about the syllabus or anything else in the class? Okay. So today we're doing history of life. We're going to cover it today, broad overview, and then on Monday, more narrow focus. Learning outcomes for today, and when you get a, a deep perspective on time, right? The earth is old, so I get a sense of how old it is. Okay. We're going to see some of the major events in Earth history, and then I also want you to start generating hypotheses and have a class discussion about what happens with mass extinctions. Okay. <coughs> so, Big Bang, 13.73 billion years ago. Okay, rapid inflation of the universe, and then Dark Ages. Why the Dark Ages? There was no light, right. Why? Stars haven't formed yet, right. Um, so, you know, early, early elements were just hydrogen and helium floating through space. It took a while for gravity to pull them together. And actually, there was a paper published, I think it was yesterday in Science, about how big those first stars were. They debate about what, what their size was. It was published yesterday. Okay, this is actually very good research. Because <coughs> a lot of some of the, the lumpiness here led to the lumpiness of those little galaxies. So the first stars produce more complex elements, and then some of them explode. Okay, um, some don't explode, some just leave in a way, but some actually explode. And so this idea from Carl Sagan that you know, you're all made of star stuff. Right? So how do you go from helium and hydrogen to iron and carbon and oxygen and good stuff like that? I don't know. Fusion. Yep. So here we have, you know, get a little fusion. I have two helium. Light from beryllium, from the helium, will come in white. Right? So the stuff that makes up you was formed deep inside a star, then died. It's kind of amazing to think about that. <coughs> Any questions about that? Okay. Much later, 4.6 billion years ago, the sun, the solar system forms. Right? So. We have a gas, you know, a gas cloud, a dust cloud that slowly accretes. In the middle, we have the sun that gets big enough to start having fusion, right? And then we have all these clumps of you know, rocky planets, gaseous planets, some broken planets before the asteroid belt. Further out, the Oort cloud of comets. Okay. <coughs> so the moon was broken off from the Earth about 4.53 billion years ago. Um, so you have this, uh, this the other sort of planetoid that hit the Earth. You know, parts of it broke off. Okay. Um, and then we have a long period of heavy bombardment. Okay. This actually isn't early Earth, it's actually moon of Saturn, but your sense of what early Earth could look like. Right? So you had this long period of <coughs> you know, rocks and things flying around, hitting, hitting the Earth's crust and melting it. Why is this relevant for us? Is there life here at this point? No. Why? Right. It's very hard to evolve to live in liquid rock. Right? So think about one carbon based life forms. You know, I put you in a hot spring, you're going to die with a little hot magma. Right? So it's going to be hard for life to evolve at this point. But almost as quickly as <coughs> the environment stops, we start seeing evidence that life evolves. And the earliest evidence we have for life is in chemical traces. Right? So if you look at you know, the way, the way um, organisms accrete their carbon chains, they often have an even number of carbon atoms, right? whereas abiotic processes often have you know, a random number from odd to even. So you can find these chemical fossils that suggest there's early life. Those are getting later from fossil chromatolites, which I can still exist today. These colonies of bacteria that grow in this shell, you know, this you know, mushroom sort of mushroom tool shape. Today. 
Let us this evolves. Okay, so it's still an active debate whether early life was first chemosynthetic or photosynthetic. Okay. Um, critically, you can't photosynthesis does and then to evolve. Why does this matter? It's oxygen, so. Aerobic processes. So what? That's great. Why do we care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, you, respiration is more efficient in getting energy. Right? So if you're, you know, running, you start having your legs burning, what's happening? Fermentation. Right? So you're, ha you're using up your, your sugars, you have to use oxygen to do so. It's a lot less efficient. Okay? And so oxygen, you know, less things burn up carbon, uh, sugar atoms, sugar molecules more efficiently, get more energy from them. Okay? Um, <coughs> your downside of oxygen, of oxygen. Reactive species, what does that mean? Right. So, what's rust? Right, oxygen combining with iron, right? That's oxidation. Okay. Oxygen is very reactive. Okay. It loves to form bonds to other things. Okay. Including, you know, you know, DNA will break up the DNA. Right. And so, <coughs> Who should be anaerobic organisms? What are those? Some, some bacteria, some archaea are anaerobic organisms. Right, what does that mean that they're anaerobic? They don't use oxygen. More important than that, even, they die. They die, they die in oxygen. Right, because oxygen is burned through them. Okay? So you have you know, molecules in your body to help protect against oxygen damage. But even so, you're still getting damaged right now. Okay? You're mutating as you speak. Kids, we also have more energy to, to use, <coughs> and so this is upside and downside. So we think there was actually, you know, an anaerobic world, and when oxygen starts coming out, we start having, you know, things things that can't adapt to oxygen have to go into more limited environments, you know, in mud flats where there's not a lot of oxygen or things like that. <coughs> Any questions about that? Okay, Huronian glaciation. Okay. So, still after the debate how much the Earth is covered with ice, but a lot of it. Right. Why is that a problem? Things need water, right? So, there's a thought that there's water underneath the ice. But, yep, yeah, what else? If it's, if it's salt froze all the way through, it would be in trouble. What else? Too cold, right? How do you get energy? Right? How do you get out of such a situation? So in our energy care, we worry about global warming, right? You know, global warming is happening, ice sheets are melting. What happens when ice sheets melt? What's, what's what? What? Water rises? Yep. Good. What else? What's, what's underneath the ice? Yeah. So the ground is, so like, in, so North Pole, it's water underneath. Um, Antarctica is land underneath, right? So we're leaving, we have white, uh, white ice, and then we have now a black ground exposed. Right? Which absorbs more heat? The black ground, right? And so then you get this feedback loop, where as you lose ice, Earth becomes darker, absorbs more heat energy, it gets warmer. Okay? Here, it's the opposite. Like Earth is colder, it gets more and more white, reflects more, absorbs less heat. Right? So there's a sort of runaway process. <coughs> And it's thought that you know, reduce, reducing of greenhouse gases saved the day back then. Not from fossil fuel, fuels, but from volcanoes. Okay. Um, which caused the earth to warm up, melt the ice, and it can go on. Interesting parallel to today. <coughs> and then a long time passes. Right? So 
we have you know, Archaea and eukaryotes diverging, and then we have eukaryotes diverging from Archaea, right? So, here, right? And we have a long time where life is still single celled. Right? So, the environment ends here, life just evolves, single cell, single cell, single cell, single cell. Why might that be? But this other is really complex. Why would that slow it down? You're right. But that's Explain why. Tree production is faster, we have short generation times and just things over things. That's one way to speed up evolution. Okay, good. What else? Oh, we should probably start raising hands so that we make sure we call it. Yeah? It depends on, so the question is, it depends on what, the, what the caused the mutation. So if it's mutations from the UV of the environment, necessarily, if it's mutations from replication error, then yeah. So that's so, and we do see that today. Also, single, modern single cell life have, tends to have Whereas DNA repair machinery than eukaryotes, so is that process too? Um, but right, good. What about selection pressures? It's less at the beginning. Why do you say that? That's right. So at first, maybe there's a few species, and so they'll get more complex species and more complex until later, if possible. Yep. Yeah. Right. So that's the complexity issue, that argument, right? So you know, if I were a single cell organism and I'm producing carbon dioxide, right? Just diffuses out of me, it's fine. In us, we right, have to have a special whole lung system and blood system to get rid of that carbon dioxide. That's a more complex thing. What about sort of selection pressure on individual cells? So take my hand. How many offspring is my hand going to have? How many offspring are my hand cells going to have? Is this forms of sort of you know infectious cancer? It actually has happened a couple of times, not humans. Right? Um, zero. Right? When I die, my cells in my hand are dead. Right? At most, only you know, two or five, maybe 20 cells in my body are going to, are going to survive and be passed on. Right? <coughs> so, what, 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 what about the rest of my cells? Right? They're stuck with just dying. Right? And so, not being passing anything on. So, you can imagine early cells, right, where we have, you know, I'm independent, I'm independent, fit together, okay, now only one of us can produce, there's a natural tension there, right? And that, that cell that, that cheats and reproduces does better than that that doesn't. So it's naturally selection pressure to breaking this apart. Okay. <coughs> That's another reason why it might be hard to evolve with the cellularity. Does that make sense? I see some fuzzy faces. Explain. What, what doesn't make sense about that? So if I have markers, okay. If I take two cells, right, and this one, you know, say four cells, right? This pair, they have the gene for getting together and then coming with the same. These two don't. Well then, these two, each of them has a chance of having offspring. I mean, there's a chance. Here, you know, only one of them have a chance of having offspring. So unless the fitness overall is higher, right, of course, some, then you're better off being single. Okay. And so that's the reason. Okay. So individual selection versus group selection. Which we'll cover again later in the course. Does that make sense now? Okay, and 
is showing the basic tree of life. I don't cover phylogenies a lot in this class. What does this represent? Right, three lineages of organisms. And then, where's their common ancestor? Right. Common ancestor there, and also here in the middle. And you have a split. Where are prokaryotes on this? And so now we typically don't use the word prokaryote, but it's not a natural thing. It's this, all the things that's minus is a. That wasn't discovered until the 1970s. This whole other group of organisms called Archaea. And so we saw the word in terms of bacteria. And if you compare the next two groups, you can compare bacteria and the archaea. Right? You don't need to know all the different groups in the university. And then some of the similarities. So, for the chromosome, you have bacteria, you have archaea, and then eukaryotes. Right? Histones, what are histones? Get the DNA coil, yep. Um, and so, bacteria don't have enough bacteria and eukaryotes to do. The gel will differ, unicellular differ, right? Organelles, and the very short clip about the discovery of archaea. More than a century after the discovery of the cell nucleus, it was believed there were two fundamental types of life on Earth. Bacteria and everything else. Bacteria were classified as prokaryotes. These were simple, single-celled organisms with their DNA contained not within a nucleus, but by the cell wall. All other life forms were classified as eukaryotes. Their cells carried their DNA enclosed within the nucleus. But this simple classification system was in for a shock. In 1977, biologist Carl Woese was studying the genetic makeup of a methane-producing microbe when he realized it was different from any known bacterium. Its cell wall was unique. It produced unusual enzymes, and its genetic sequence was unlike anything he'd ever seen. It became soon apparent within the, within the scope of the space of an hour that there, would, there was something a third thing out there. This was the moment of discovery. Carl Woese had found a third form of life, a group of single-celled organisms that he called archaea. We used to think there were two primary kingdoms on this planet. Now we know there are three. That was the shift, big shift. Because all of microbiology had been structured around the idea that all bacteria are fundamentally the same. Not in their details, but in their essence, their ancestry, and their basic cell organization. Here is something that every microbiologist and biologist firmly believed in, and it wasn't true. <laughs> so it does make you smile, doesn't it? Yeah. Look what I found. Right. <laughs> so... It's kind of cool how this shows sort of how discoveries are made. Right? So everyone thought there was two. One guy went out and found, oh, there's evidence for three, and published his findings, came to agree with him, and I know there's three. This is how way discourse works in science, right? Where you go out through nature, find evidence, bring it to bear on arguments. Is that getting early single cell life, or early multicellular life? This Edicarin product? You know, people are disagree. People still disagree about what they did. You know, how many were photosynthetic, how many can move. Um, we also have we also have track. Some stuff can move that. Okay. Then we have the Cambrian. Okay, I'll talk about this more on Monday. 
you start having hard skeletons, you start having the ability to detect light. Why might that be cool? Right, so you can so you can travel towards life energy, and so some photosynthetic like Luna, single cell things can, can detect light and go towards it. Right? If you're a multicellular thing that's you know consuming other things or being consumed, how is that useful? Exactly, so you can detect movement. Right, so if I can I'm if you're here, you know, a pilot I can go here and see it now shady, you know, we can run. Um, or if you're a predator, you know, you can detect, oh, there's something moving there, you go get it. Okay. So it's a really cool way of remote detecting things. Right? Rather than having to feel it in the water, you go and actually you know, see the regulation. Okay. And here we see, you know, this long sort of spiraling timeline. Sure. We have information error, long time passes. later, but on Monday. Okay. Um, one big element of life was the Permian Triassic extinction. Right? And this is when between 99 and 95 and 99% of all species went extinct. Right? So you go from something like this, something like this. Huge, you know, also biodiversity. Okay. Not all life. Right? So life survives. Rounding error will survive. Right? Um, but lots of things will extinct. Then after that, dinosaurs evolved. Right? And then KT, right? tertiary extinction, locked in our space, plus possibly other factors, caused non avian dinosaurs to go extinct. Why, do I, why did I say non avian dinosaurs? So the birds, yeah, birds are dinosaurs. Right? So you have dinosaur from Thanksgiving. Um, <coughs> actually kind of cool, after dinosaurs, other dinosaurs went extinct, later on they evolved terror birds in South America, which like a re-evolution of dinosaur form. It's flightless, you know, think of an ostrich or a big bird, but really doesn't mean it's a carnivore. And they're giant beasts. You know, chasing the other you know, So I'd like to you actually, you know, like this little wings, right? It's still a nasty thing how come it is. So that's sort of evidence potential. Okay, what's happening next? <coughs> so our sun eventually going to become a red giant. And actually, there's a paper published about the future of Earth, right? And so it's going to expand. And it's still not clear whether it's going to expand to include the Earth inside its radius, or just really close to the Earth. Either way, it gets very toasty here. <coughs> um, and so. You know, here's a timeline of life. Yeah. Here's now. Here's when life evolved. Here's when the cellular evolved. Here's when life is extinct. Right, because the <coughs> oceans boil away, and it becomes too hot to have water on it. Okay. So, we can appreciate our life. Of course, it can be life el elsewhere, too. We we're going to talk about in the, in the last day or two of the class. Um, the Earth life in the same classes you failed, this rest is really done. Any questions about this? Is life preparing for this? No. Why? Raise space hands. So a billion years ago, eh? Yep. Um, good. So what? I mean, it's also a huge selection factor coming up, for you, right? Evolution not right? Evolution is not forward thinking. So how evolution happens? You know, a bunch of organisms. Some have more offspring than others. Some die faster than others. You know, those that survive more, that have more offspring, you know, their traits are passed on. 
there's no, you know, pre-adaptation for things that you know, and that the factors that aren't you know, happening yet. And they, they might happen to be pre-adapted, so if, you know, asteroid comes, those that can survive the best the longest without food might do better. Right? They didn't evolve that ability because an asteroid might be coming. They just had the ability for some other reason, and then so it happened to select So, Cockroach is really adapted to surviving in human spaceships, and then it survives, and we travel to elsewhere because we're on our spaceships, right? They're not evolving nowhere to escape the heat death, the death of the Earth, right? They just have this ability to you know, live with other organisms, and it just happens to help them in the future. Right? Others are not fully really concerned. Any questions about that? How, what would be the mechanism for it? Well, we do that, right? So, you know, we have ET corn, right? So we've evolved corn that produces a bacteria, a bacterial-derived gene to kill, uh, um, to kill some herbivores, right? <coughs> um, our ancestors, when they started cultivating wheat or corn or squash, peppers, right? That's that's selection, right? And so we could prepare for that. So we know global warming's happening. People are now actually working on developing crop strains that can handle higher temperatures, lower, lower rainfall, things like that. So we can have that sort of selection happen. It's true. So that's artificial selection. Yeah? Evolving a mind. Right, so we could say, okay, we know we're you know, going to go, you know, prepare from this point. So let's you know, constantly prepare for that. Right, so we didn't evolve a mind in order to do that. Now we have this trait that allows us to sort of Other questions about this? Yeah. I say, this class, really good discussion this year. I'm very, very impressed. Good. All right. So, there's a major discussion in the course. How many major extinctions like the one in the primate affect life? So, what I want you to do is break things into pairs or triplets and talk to each other about it. And I'll come back as a group and talk about what we think. So, just turn to your neighbors and talk about this. As a, as a jet, yes, the question is, as a major extinction now, this is a general thing, like well, what sort of causes would be able to happen afterwards? Oh yeah, you, you can tell each other your names too. That's often good. Thanks.
Right, one minute left. All right, let's start. So let's, so we'll move around the room, and so we'll start with this group, and then work from the back up. But if some, some group says something you want to comment on, please do. It's like, oh, no, you're wrong. So, wait. So what's adaptive radiation? So what's adaptive radiation? And the last piece of all in a short period of time, the higher rate of character evolution as well. Right, that's one time we're going to have a lecture about this later in the semester. Right, that's what, adaptive radiation. So we think of some you know cool diversity like. African like cichlids, right? We have we have this they fish form, you have these ones that are doing like crazy things. Some are crushing mollusks, some are pretending to be dead, some are evolved to eating the scales off the sides of fish. They have, like, a, they have a, like, a lefty mouth or a righty mouth. I mean crazy stuff that evolved very, very quickly. That's a classic adaptive radiation. Good. And bottlenecking? Okay, anyone? Jack Ball and nothing. Yeah. It's like when you have a big pool, you have diversity, and the students try to just come with it, and that's what you have to work with. So it doesn't need to be like step long. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, you know, all of humanity outside this room went extinct, it's just us, right? We may all be lactose intolerant. And so from that point on, humanity is lactose intolerant. Right? Yeah, guys. <laughs> I'm glad you really choose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that'd be a little Jack Okay, good. Next group. Mm -hmm. This competition lots of things are dead. So we'll have both numerically fewer species, numerically fewer individuals in those species at first. Right. Why would that lead to adaptive radiation? Look, everything's dead. Let's have more species now. What's, what's, the, what's the causal link? Okay, more environments? Okay, what are you going to say? Okay, so niches opening up could be evolved into. Why does that increase the speciation rate? So that's what we don't need, you know, use all the available niches. Right. If you have some genetic variation that allows you to start using this unused niche, then you can have more offspring than ones that are stuck with the old niche. Right. So that increases the rates. Maybe the causes of the speciation are the same, but you know what happens to the new species? They occupy new niches, they don't go extinct. And that could be a connection. Right, that's great because when people talk about adaptive radiation, often we don't actually talk about the mechanism. We're only 
Martha Stewart, it's a good thing, right? Because so like, you know, always empty niches, it's a good thing, we'll become more species. But why do you become more species? It's a good start. Think about the mechanism of connections. It's good. Okay, next period. Right. So you have less redundancy, right? So you have fewer species. And so if, you know, by chance you have an effort to happen and only those that live on the ground survive, fine. But then you have an ice age and only, only those that have some other traits survive. And now we're having smaller pool to smaller pool. Right. Especially one of the concerns with things going extinct now. So we're having climate change and things like that. We might not have enough variation and stuff to recover. And then feeding the leaks. Yep. That's true. Why? No, that's a good point. So, I mean, what 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 is extinction, right? Can we go from having you know a thousand individuals to two individuals to zero individuals? Right? And so this is we're absorbing boundary. Right? If we had the population size fluctuating through time, mm -hmm. and we get zero. Come on, right? If you already have you know a million individuals. It's harder for you to wiggle over to zero than to have 100 individuals to start with. Good. That's all. That's really good. Okay. It's a pesky. What, what is, what's that thing about? Organisms have adapted to live in, you know, uh, variable habitats and some are more specialized. Right? So, like coast redwoods, you know, they're wonderful, crazy organisms, right? They require temperatures and like that. And if that happens, wow, you have this crazy thing. You're not going to have them taking over the Great Plains, right? But a cockroach in that environment could. It's good. Okay, uh, next group. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, so if you're sort of food limited, so it becomes adapted to become smaller, and also the bias could become smaller. It's good. And we see this sometimes with evolution of things on islands. Right, so um, who's heard of Humble Florensis? Okay, yeah, what is it? Right. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm Flores. Right. So it's humanoid. I'm not sure how close they are related they are to us. Right, but these small humans, and they hunted tiny little mammoths. They're also living in the islands. Okay. We're talking about elephants, right? Because they shrank. Yeah. Yeah, tiny humans hunting tiny. Other dead. <laughs> it's yes. Yeah, it, it's not clear exactly when they died. It's not clear if it, if it was overlap with sapiens or not. Um, yeah. Sorry. Actually, I have something about that. They actually, if you see where it's the genome of the people in the Philippines and stuff, you can actually see like segments of Homo Homo Florentis DNA in their genomes, like and also some Australians, some Aboriginal tribes. Sure, yeah, there's a, we'll talk about the Neanderthals case in a little while, but yeah, it's really cool. People like, you know, so we have these other species in the same genus. What do we do with them? Do we have sex with them? Do we eat them? You know, so it may be both. They certainly have sex. <laughs> and so we have evidence of Neanderthal genes in us. That's cool. Okay, next group.
Mm -hmm. Right, so if you have a localized, very bad event and it's less bad elsewhere, motility will take the scarce away from that. It's a good, it's a good thing. We're having widespread populations. Good. That's good. Uh, you said that, oh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, the survivors were like, <laughs> What's the generalist and specialist? So they'd have to be able to call out more variety of foods rather than a specific species. Okay. And good. And so that, that's something we see in mass extinctions. The only question is, does that happen during the mass extinction or after? So do you evolve to become a generalist? Or are those that are not dead generalists? What do you think? I think the ones that are left after evolved. Okay. Right, so it depends on the extinction cause, right? But if, if it's, you know, uh, asteroid winter, right, or it's less food everywhere, then generals might be better. Um, but if it's something else, then maybe they're going to evolve something else, right? Good. That's good. Um, I guess somebody thought of the um, I don't think they said it was about the ecological relationship to be broken down. Like you say, what's the magic of the two stars? And the existence of the water, and then you have to evolve some sort of Mm -hmm. What's the what's nitrogen fixer? Um, What's your gambling problem? <laughs> Something that pulls nitrogen out of the air and gets the bacteria. So, nitrogen, I mean, you know, you have an N and an N and three bonds, right? It's very hard to break that apart. But yet, we need that nitrogen for things like DNA and proteins. It's only a few things that evolve the ability to break that apart and make it into something that's usable. And it's a general case of you know, while these co-evolved systems will break apart, right, what, will that, what will that do for the general specialists? Yep, yeah, right. So if I require this, so there's a um, Darwin, there's a, what is it, uh, something predicta. So Darwin um, found this hawk moth that is hugely long proboscis. He said, I predict someone is an orchid that has a nectar spur long enough for this to go in. Right? And then, you know, like 80 years later, some people found it. Right? And a few years ago, we actually had a video of it pollinating. Right? But if either the moth goes extinct or the orchid goes extinct, the other one's going to go extinct too. Because they can't survive without each other. And so we see this loss of this complexity of ecosystems happening after mass extinction as well. And how you see it in the evolution and ecology coming together. Okay, I've got mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And also have all these empty niches, right? So when they're not even natural, yeah. That's Right, so there's two things there, right? So the one's the empty niches thing, and one is the, you know, being able to cross adaptive valleys, right? Um, so when is selection most effective? What population size is selection most effective in? Because we've had intro genetics or evolution. Right, so in a large population, selection would be more effective, right? So you don't have, you know, Bob has this great adaptive allele and Bob looks by butts, right? We have <coughs> a large enough pool that has alleles in present in 1% of the population has a lot of individuals. Right? So you have a lot of buses to pick them. Okay? So these random stochastic factors aren't as effective in wiping out adaptive alleles. Right? So if you go to a small population size, then genetic drift is more important. Act right? more active. If you actually have deleterious alleles, it will sweep through in a small population that's going to happen in the larger population. So that may actually happen in the mass extinction. It's not something to really think about much. It's a good kind of quick test. Um, and the other thing is the you know, empty niches thing, right? So before um, the KT extinction, what were mammals like? Either small little like shrew type things that you know ate insects, made some seeds. There's actually some debate about this. If you look at some dating of molecular phylogenies, we think that some really actually predate the KT. 
I guess it's a monkey that's apparently alive in the Cretaceous, which is the only group of states that's out there. But I've been generally thought mammals are in the smallest of diverse respects. After KT, we've evolved, you know, crazy giant thing, whales, like ground sloth, things like that. Right? And <coughs> because now we have no large predators, no large herbivores, we can be niches. So other thoughts about what might happen, what we missed. That's true. So we don't actually think about these projects much, but they actually matter a lot in ecology. Right? And so one thought that one thing that could have led to the Cambrian explosion is having all these borrowers that are churning up the sediments and we don't have this in of layer anymore. We start having oxygen flow around, no oxygen available. And so you can imagine organisms that structure structure environments, you know, the fevers go extinct, there's no beaver pond goes, but more oxygen love borrowers and things like that. Trees, if you don't if you lost trees and the whole canopy structure's gone, all these things are gone. Right, so again, this connection between e ecology and evolution. It's good. What else? How long how long might what recovery take? So would you have ever recover? What, what what might I mean by recover? Right, so it's saying thinking about, you know, that getting the same species back, the same amount of complexity in the ecosystem. Millions of years. And whatever survives is gonna be is gonna affect what you get in the future. So if you lose dinosaurs, you're never gonna get dinosaurs back. You're never gonna re evolve giant land reptilian predators. Mm -hmm. So if you always have to They'll tell the Australians that. Sorry. Salt water crossing. Yeah, that's true. But you're gonna have you're gonna have the whatever's left evolving. And so if you have something you might have different competitive interactions and things that existed before and you truly hope you might never get that back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think you bring out like number of species or something then, you know, tens of millions of years that were to get back to diversity. But like trilobites, they're gone, they're gone forever. Ammonites, gone, gone forever. Um, and so you can look at those lineages that they're pruned off, they're gone. Um, we have lots of things like today that's just like one or two species, right? So ginkgo, this is a tree, it's one species. Coelacanths, there's you know, two, maybe three species. Pusher crabs, right? It's one, you know, one cool species. Things one species. Two, two species. <coughs> Which they go extinct and that's it for that language. Alright, any questions about any of this? Other thoughts? Okay, well, I'll see you on Monday. I'm just going to say this has been a great group. I'm really excited about this semester. So, good.